These are the notes on propulsion in space. This always makes me think of the Muppet Show, and they had a little skit that was pigs in space. That's why I was doing that reverb there. Interestingly, the guy who did the voice for Miss Piggy and Fozzie Bear is the same guy, Frank Oz, who did the voice for Yoda. So I think that's interesting. So there is a connection, I guess, to space. Well, that's science fiction. Anyway, whatever. Interesting. So to understand propulsion in space, we really have to think about how a rocket changes its velocity, changes either its speed or direction, right? Velocity is both. And it's easier to consider if we make it an isolated system, a closed system, okay? So a rocket has to carry both its fuel and its oxidizer because you're not just burning your fuel in the air where there's plenty of oxygen around you, you have to bring along the oxygen, let's just say. It doesn't have to be oxygen, but that's a very typical one. So it has more than one chemical. Every chemical you need for the reaction combines them, and very typically this produces hot gases. So the gases are funneled out from one side of the ship, and as those gases leave at very high speed, they actually, through Newton's third law, propel the rocket in the opposite direction. Now they do the same thing when they're in the Earth's atmosphere, but then there's oxygen available around. Can't always make use of that because it's actually uh, possible to burn up all the oxygen nearby and not have a steady supply. So even when the rockets are launching off the pad and are still inside the Earth's atmosphere, typically they carry their oxidizer with them because they'll be moving so fast and burning up oxygen so quickly, there would never be enough provided by the air around them, like in a typical reaction, okay? So now that you understand how rockets change their velocity, then we can think about it as action-reaction, okay? And because it's action-reaction, and if we think about it as a closed system, well, then we can use the conservation of momentum. Isn't that great? So now that we can use the conservation of momentum, we have to consider the momentum before, initially, and the momentum after. And what are the two objects? What is A and B? Well, A is probably going to be the rocket itself, the mass of the entire rocket. And B will be the fuel, okay, so the momentum of the fuel altogether. Now, the only thing about this that's interesting is that as the rocket expel uses up its fuel its mass does change because the fuel makes up part of the mass of the rocket but at any given moment that change is very minor so that's another thing that we like to ignore when doing these calculations wow we sure do ignore a lot the great thing about outer space is there's virtually no friction it really is negligible it's so low that even if you added it in it would not change your answer even in the thousandths place. So the great thing about space is there really is no friction. But there are other considerations that we're still having to simplify just so that we can do these calculations. So if the rocket and the chemicals are the system, well then the system is a closed system. If the forces that expel the gases are internal forces within that system, well, then the system is also an isolated system. And guess what? That's everything we need to use the conservation of momentum. So objects in space can accelerate using the law of conservation of momentum. And it also, of course, involves Newton's third law of motion, action, reaction. So what they do is they have a chemical reaction throwing out material in one direction. Well, that obviously will force the rocket to go in the opposite direction. Now this will only apply if we are far enough away from a major field force like the Earth's gravity or the Moon's gravity in this picture or the Sun's gravity. You can't be in a really really strong gravitational field and ignore it but you know what if you're far enough away then you kinda can. It's not perfect but again we just like to ignore the things that we can when we're doing these calculations.
So you can think of what is moving the rocket as being the impulse. The fuel is providing the impulse. It's providing a force over time. If you apply force over time, well, that leads to a change in momentum. Of course, another way to calculate the impulse, which leads to the change in momentum, is the mass and the velocity. Okay, that will tell you the force that is applied over time. I'll show you an example of this. This will make more sense after seeing the example. So here we have a problem that involves conservation of momentum. But this is not a very obvious one, so try to follow along here. So it's the conservation of momentum. Okay, so we're talking about the system, the rocket and its fuel. Okay, before and after, that'll be the same. But what's going to change the momentum? What changes the momentum is the impulse. So remember that the impulse is the force over time. So that's not over time. It's the force uh, multiplied by a duration of time, I should say. So let me read the problem. A rocket expels gases at a rate of 5.1 times 10 to the fifth kilograms per second with a speed of 9.2 times 10 to the third meters per second. By the way, that's the speed of the gases, if that wasn't clear. That's the rate the gas is being expelled and the speed the gases are moving. Interesting. So what is the force exerted on the rocket? Huh. Well, as I already indicated, we will be using impulse calculations, which if you think about it, are derived from the law of the conservation of momentum, but it might not be immediately obvious which of the two we are gonna need to use. So it's gonna be one of those two on the bottom, but which one do you think is going to apply to this calculation? The one on the left or the one on the right? Remember, the one on the left says, you can figure out how much the momentum will change. That's basically what that's saying. If you know the force and how much time, right? The one on the right is saying you can figure out um, the mass times the velocity if you know the force over time. And that would be sort of how much the rocket is changed, let's say. So which one do you think it's gonna be? Which one? It might not be obvious, but it is this one. So we're gonna be using this equation to solve this problem. Okay, let's write it in. Now, the only problem is, do you notice, do we have the mass and the velocity? Well, we have the velocity of the gases and we have, we don't exactly have the mass. We have the rate. That's weird. So what is a rate? A rate is, in this case, mass over time. So what we need to do here is rearrange this equation. What would happen if I isolated my force, got force on its own, which is after all what we're solving for, right? We're solving for just the F, not the impulse, which is the F delta T, just the F. So to get F on its own, to isolate it, we have to get rid of its roommate. We have to divide both sides by delta T. And if we divide the left side by delta T, it's just gone. And then we wind up with this equation. Oh, interesting. Sometimes we have to rearrange algebraic equations. And if you think about it, then this is exactly the information we have. We have the kilograms per second. That's like the M over delta T times the V. We have the V, right? So we could have written the M over the delta T and we could have had the V on the side to make it a little more clear here, but it is the information we have. So now if we just substitute those, We've got the M divided by delta T, which is the 5.1 times 10 to the fifth kilograms per second. By the way, 5.1 times 10 to the fifth, how much is that? That's 510,000 kilograms every second, every one second. That's what that means. Okay, and we're multiplying it by the other number, 9.2 times 10 to the third meters per second. Well, in this case, we're given the numbers in scientific notation, so it kind of makes you give your answer in scientific notation. So that's not like an extra step. That's just something that's going to happen almost automatically. So remember, we multiply the first portions together and then we add the exponents. And what we get from that is, oh yeah, what's going to happen with the units? So it's going to be kilograms times meters. And then both of the seconds are in the denominator. 
So then we'll wind up as kilogram meters per second squared. That's going to be our unit. So 46.9 times 10 to the eighth. See what I did there? I multiplied the 5.1 times the 9.2, and I got 46.9. And then I added the exponents. 10 to the fifth times 10 to the third gives you 10 to the eighth. Get it? And then the units wind up like that because the kilograms times the meters. Does that make sense? It should. Okay. But as you should also know, that is not the correct answer. Why not? Because that's not proper. That is not proper scientific notation. So I have to move the decimal one place to the left, which will change the exponent. If you move over one place to the left, what does that do to your exponent? It goes up by one. So let me rewrite that as 4.69 times 10 to the ninth kilogram meters per second squared. Ooh, there's one more thing I should probably fix there. What's another way to write that unit? We're talking about force here, right? What's the unit of force? Like it's the same one we use when you talk about the weight of an object. Remember F equals MA. So it's the mass times the, it's the mass, uh, sorry, so it's the mass times the acceleration. So kilograms, meters per second squared. Oh yeah, but there's another way to write it. Newtons. So the best way to write this answer, the one that I would circle, would be 4.69 times 10 to the ninth Newtons. Proper scientific notation and proper unit. Boom. Now that is not an obvious problem. That is not the most obvious one, but you can sort of see that that is the force that is being applied on the rocket. Okay, action, reaction. That is sort of the force that is exerted on the gases. It's also the force that's exerted on the rocket equal and opposite reactions. If we ignore distant gravitational fields, this will tell us how much the rocket is changed in momentum, how much the momentum of the rocket is changed, okay? If we multiply this by the amount of time. So let's say you just did a burn for a few seconds. Well, then you would multiply that times however many seconds, like for two seconds, it would be that times two seconds. That's not gonna make a huge change. But what if you applied that force over hours or days, well, that would make a crazy change in the momentum. So that's why we call the impulse, it's the force multiplied by the amount of time that it is applied for. Okay, so that is critical for understanding momentum, is understanding impulse. There are also times that we can use the recoil equation, but remember the recoil equation only applies if your initial velocity is zero. So if the initial velocity of both objects begins at zero, okay? But of course that depends on your frame of reference. So actually there are other times you can use it as long as you consider your initial reference frame as being zero. Let me show you an example of this. But before we get to that example, let's talk a little bit about our terminology for a person that goes into space. Now, we are familiar in English of talking about people that go into space as astronauts, okay? The term astronaut comes from the Greek astro and not, which really means a star sailor or a sailor of the stars. Now, are they really sailing? Well, that's debatable, I guess you call uh, someone who's in the Navy on a nuclear submarine, you'd call them a sailor, even though they're not using the wind anymore. Okay, so I guess that they could be a sailor, but are they really going to the stars? Not the ones that we send out. In fact, you could argue that an astronaut gets no closer to the stars than we are right now, than you are right now. Now, how can I say that? That's because the stars are in every direction. They're not only the ones we see at night, there's also stars up there in the sky during the day. We just can't see them because the sky gets so bright, okay, with the sunlight. So there's stars in every direction. So moving into Earth orbit or even going as far as the moon gets you absolutely no closer to the stars than you are right now. Not to mention that, of course, we're going around the sun, so we're getting closer to some stars and farther from others at any given moment anyway which is much, much greater difference than just going into Earth orbit or going to the moon would be. So they're not really star sailors. They could go to planets, we haven't done that yet, but then they would be planet knots. 
that would make more sense. It doesn't sound good though, does it? That doesn't sound so great. Interestingly, the term astronaut dates all the way back to 1880. That's 140 years ago. And obviously there were no real astronauts back then, but people could dream. Okay, in science fiction, they had this idea that you could go into space like Jules Verne. And this one was by Percy Gregg. I've actually never heard of him. And uh, he had a, his vessel was called the astronaut. Okay, it kind of makes sense. But in other countries, they don't call them astronauts. So what about some of the other terminology? Well, rem remember the big space race in the 20th century? It was between the US and the Soviet Union. So what did the Soviet Union call the people they sent into space? They called them cosmonauts. And just like in the US, they sent men and women. Even in the Soviet Union, they actually sent up dogs. That was actually the first living creature to travel in space was actually a dog. And then we also sent up uh, chimps. So there've been other things in space than just people. You might not have thought about that. What does cosmonaut come from? Very poetic. A sailor of the cosmos. Okay, we even use the Greek word cosmos in English. Okay, that would mean like the universe. It's kind of a poetic way of saying that. And I guess you could say, well, I, they're sailing through the universe. That's true, but you know what? So are we. We're on this spaceship, the Earth, traveling around the sun, sailing through the universe. And the sun is sailing around, I guess, the Milky Way galaxy. I'm taking this metaphor too far, but people often forget that we are moving through the universe as we speak, because we don't feel it, okay? Because it's an inertial frame of reference. Okay, but what about one you maybe haven't heard about? You probably heard of astronauts, cosmonauts. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But what about the newer one? The one that we're hearing more of increasingly as they plan a mission to go back to the moon. Who's planning to go back to the moon? Well, we might do it eventually, but who's planning to do it in the near future? Who's gearing up their economy, focusing on it? China. So China is intending to send people back to the moon. It would be the second country to send people to the moon. Only the United States has done it so far. We did it six times, but then we stopped when I was just a little kid is when they stopped. So if China does it, okay, well, they're not going to call them astronauts. They have their own name. They didn't want to call them cosmonauts either. Okay. They decided to go with Taikonaut. And that comes from the Chinese word for outer space or space. So these are space sailors. Now, why is China investing so much money in going back to the moon? Well, they're actually looking for a couple of things. They're looking for gold. You might be surprised that there's a lot of gold on the moon. You'd have to find it, but there's probably easier pickings on the surface of the moon than there would be on the surface of the earth because all the gold that was lying on the surface of the earth, somebody's picked up by now, right? Also, they're looking for helium-3, which is a really interesting um, isotope of helium. It's really hard to find on Earth, but it's actually an easy one for using in nuclear fusion, and it's not radioactive. So there's very few things that you can make nuclear fusion out of that are not radioactive. It would be kind of like safe fusion. And it's all over the surface of the moon because the moon is bombarded by solar radiation. So that's an interesting thing. So that's the reason, that's their justification for going back to the moon, as well as I guess their national pride. Like we still revel in the fact that we are the only country that sent people to the moon, okay? So I guess we better get going if we're gonna be like the first people to Mars, right? So let's get moving. Anyway, since there are Tychonauts, I thought I'd use Tychonauts in my example rather than the regular old astronaut or cosmonaut, try to change it up a bit. So let's talk about conservation of momentum in space. On the left, you see the regular conservation equation, and on the right, you see the one where it's split up into the mass and the velocity, okay? Well, we're not gonna really use either of those. We're gonna try to use an example where we're starting at zero. Remember, when you're starting with a velocity of zero, then you can use the recoil equation. So the recoil equation is actually just a modified version of the one above. If, if the ones on the left, if the velocity is zero, 
then all the terms on the left side of the equation drop to zero. If that happens, you can just shuffle it around. I did not show you how to derive this, but it's not that hard to come up with the equation on the bottom, recoil. Once you have that equation, it's a lot easier to solve for the velocities. So we're going to call the Tychonaut C, okay, and we're going to call the uh, material, the hot gas ejected from the pistol, which is a thrust pistol, um, we are going to call that D, okay? So for the purposes of this calculation, the Tycho knot is D and the gases are C, got it? Also notice right below the question, there's that little tiny uh, indicator of which direction is positive. It says X, positive X is to the right. So to the right will be positive, to the left will be negative. Okay, so we're going to use the recoil equation for this one. Let me read the question. A Tychonaut at rest fires a thruster pistol that expels 50 grams of hot gas at 900 meters per second. The combined mass of the Tychonaut and the pistol is 100 kilograms. How fast and in what direction is the Tychonaut moving after firing the pistol? Okay, so here's the thing. This one doesn't give me a rate, but let's assume that it just shoots out the gas in a quick burst, okay? In a quick burst, and then it's done, and then it stops. It doesn't continually thrust, okay? So the total amount of gas that is expelled is 50 grams, and that the velocity of that gas, at least on average, is 900 meters per second. That's all we need for this calculation. So is everything in the right units that I would need for my equation? Mm, I think everything is with one exception. Don't you have a problem with that 50 grams? Would this equation work if I put the mass of the Tycho knot in as 100 kilograms, but then the mass of the gas that is expelled in 50 grams? Does that sound right? Of course not. They have to be in the same unit. So what would 50 grams be? And remember, we're calling the gas D, okay? The, the, the Tycho knot is C and the gas is D, so the mass of D. What would that be in kilograms? Well, remember, there's a thousand grams in a kilogram. So you would need to divide 50 by 1,000 to get kilograms. And if you divide by 1,000, it moves the decimal over thrice to the left so what would I wind up with? 0 0.050 kg. Now notice that I put the zero before the decimal. Many students will leave that one out, but it is important to always have something in the ones place. So please, when you write a decimal, a number that's less than one, please start off with that zero point. That's a good, that's a good habit to have. Okay, so now it's in kilograms. So now we can use it in our equation. So what is that equation? Okay, there it is. So we're solving for the VCF, that's the final velocity of the Tycho knot, okay? And we're using the mass of the two as a ratio, but of course one becomes negative, and, and we're using the velocity of the gases, which is the VDF. Okay, so let's put that in. All right. So notice I've had to make the mass of the gases negative, okay? Even though there is no such thing as negative mass, I put it in as negative 0 0.050 kilograms, okay? I'm not saying that the mass is negative, but in this equation, you put a negative sign in front of it. And then on the bottom, I'm putting in the mass of the Tycho knot and the pistol, it's 100 kilograms. And then I'm putting in the final velocity of the hot gases, which of course, oh, is negative. Now, why is it negative? Because look at the direction that the gas is moving, to the left, right? So the gas is moving to the left. Which direction do you think the Tycho knot is going to wind up going? To the right, of course. So how's that going to work if I have a negative number? Notice that we have two negative numbers and we're multiplying them. So a negative times a negative gives you a positive. So first, before we do that, let's divide that ratio. Let's do numerator divided by denominator, and we get 0 0.0005, because remember, when you divide by 100, 
it moves the decimal over two more places. So now we've got even more zeros there, two more zeros. So it's a super small number, okay? Now notice that that's tenths, hundredths, thousandths, ten thousandths. So you could say five ten thousandths, negative five ten thousandths. So that's a very, very small number. Now we might have wanted to put that in scientific notation, uh, but let's just save that until the end, okay? Then what we need is to multiply the numbers. And as I said, a negative times a negative is a positive. So we are going to wind up with a positive velocity, which would be to the right, okay? And then 0 0.0005 times 900 gives you 0 0.45 meters per second. Now that's positive. 0.45 meters per second. But that's not good enough. I want to have that in scientific notation, of course. So then I have to move the decimal. I have to move it to the right this time. So what kind of an exponent does that give me? If I have to move the decimal to the right, what kind of an exponent does that give me in scientific notation? It gives me a negative exponent. I only have to move it once, so it'll be negative one. So the answer could also be written positive 4.5 times 10 to the negative 1 meters per second. Okay? So that is the answer, and I probably want to circle that answer. Okay? Now it's positive 4.5 times 10 to the negative 1 meters per second. So that already tells me which direction the Tycho knot is moving. But if I would just want to be very, very clear, I could write underneath that to the right. That's in the diagram. In space, it's hard to say which direction is uh, truly left or right, unless you're talking about from the perspective of the actual Tychonaut. But we're not talking about the Tychonaut's perspective because their, that their right is not the direction you're going. So it's in the diagram to the right. And that's how you solve an equation using the recoil. Uh, that's how you solve a problem using the recoil equation in space okay but remember this will only work if your initial velocity was zero okay if your initial velocity is zero then all those terms drop away your initial momentum is zero then you can use recoil in order to talk about the next concept i want to remind you of an example that i did back on the notes on momentum about a vehicle a car basically that is stopping gradually, stopping suddenly, or hitting a wall. Now, obviously, if it stops gradually, it brings itself down from whatever velocity it had at the beginning and whatever momentum it had at the beginning, all the way down to zero. But the same thing happens if it stops suddenly. It's got the same initial momentum and the same final momentum. Okay, final momentum would be zero. The same thing happens if it hits a wall. It's got the same initial momentum and the same final momentum. So the change in momentum in all three scenarios is the same, actually. The only question is how much force is being applied in each situation. Obviously, if you're going to stop all of that momentum very, very quickly, it takes a much greater force over a short period of time. That would be the 0 0.22 second example. Or if you stop very gradually, well, it doesn't take very much force if you want to stop all that momentum over a longer period of time. So remember that the impulse, okay, is really the force times the time it is applied. So you can accomplish the same amount of change of momentum, okay, with a different force, a much smaller force, over a longer period of time. So you might wonder, why am I using a car example when now we're talking about propulsion in space, well, there was a car launched into space as kind of a promotional effort. They launched a Tesla into space. So there has been a car in space and it's even been viewed by telescopes. That's actually the car viewed from a telescope. It looks like a dot. Um, but also it's the same concept that we see in some modern spacecraft. So this is just a recap of what I just said. So when a driver stops suddenly, well, you need the impulse has to be enough to bring the driver's momentum to zero to kind of kill all that momentum. Okay. 
A large change in momentum occurs only when there is a large impulse. Okay, but remember, an impulse can be made from a large force over a short period of time or from a small force acting over a long period of time. I guess the third option would be a moderate amount of force acting over a medium amount of time. All three of those could accomplish the same change of momentum. Got it? So that's why we have things like airbags in cars, because you want that delta T to be longer. If the delta T is a longer period of time, well, then it doesn't require as much force to bring you to rest, okay? So they try to stretch out the amount of time that the force is applied over, thereby lowering the amount of force, thereby making it a lot safer for the passenger, okay? But in, a, in every event, remember the impulse is the same because impulse is not just one variable, it's the F delta T, that whole thing is the impulse. So how does this relate to propulsion in space? Well, if you have an ion engine, which is something that has been used for the past decade or so, it's been experimented on, and it's increasingly becoming more efficient, what you can do is you can just shoot out little ions out of your spacecraft. Now, this is not used to launch a spacecraft, but once it's already in space, remember, there's very few forces acting on it as long as you're far from a strong gravitational field force. So it is possible to actually change the momentum using a very, very tiny engine that only emits ions, okay? Now, ions individually have a microscopic mass, very, very tiny mass. And an ion engine generally only exerts about as much force as the weight of a sheet of paper. So put a piece of paper on your hand and feel how heavy that is. That's about the same amount of force as these ion drives are capable of producing. But if you think about it, what if they were to do that small amount of force over a long, long period of time? It's very different from a traditional rocket engine, okay, when it produces a very, very strong thrust for a short period of time. In an ion engine, usually it would be a noble gas that is produced, like, ze like xenon. Xenon atoms are expelled at a very high speed, but they're so low mass that it's still a very tiny force. But if you exert that force continuously over a long period of time, it can add up to a major change in momentum. And once you've changed the momentum, well, nothing's gonna stop that because there's very little friction in space, almost completely neg negligible for real, okay, not just because we wanna negate it for our calculations. In reality, you can negate it and be pretty much correct. So instead of operating for only a few minutes, as a traditional rocket does, the ion engine will just keep going continuously for days or weeks or months or even years maybe. Okay, so then the impulse delivered can be can match something exerted by a traditional rocket that would have been done over the course of just a few minutes. Okay, and this is interesting because theoretically there's no limit to this. What if you had an ion engine that continued to act over the course of let's say years. Well, then it could continue to accelerate the spacecraft approaching relativistic speeds, theoretically. If you could do it for long enough, that's really one way that you could get someone to a very high velocity without crushing them because actually people can only tolerate so much force. If the force becomes too excessive, people get you know sort of squished. So the spacecraft can only go accelerate as fast as the human body can tolerate, if it contains people, of course. If it's an unmanned spacecraft, there are still are lim limitations because it can damage some of your circuitry, et cetera, if you go at too much of a, an acceleration. And of course, the acceleration depends on the force, right? F equals ma. So even though we've only been using ion engines in the 21st century, obviously George Lucas had this all figured out back in the 1970s. Because do you know what TIE fighter stands for? TIE is an acronym that stands for Twin Ion Engine. So presumably, 
These are fueled by ion engines. And my old chemistry joke was that there's got to be a cationic engine and an anionic engine, presumably. But the only problem with this is ion engines, at least as we understand them, would not be capable of any sort of fast acceleration. It would be sort of like you put a TIE fighter out there in space and then just gradually it builds up its velocity, which would build up its momentum. Okay, remember, because the impulse would be um, delivered over a long interval of time, right? So it would be a very little amount of force. So they would not be able to navigate the way that you see them in any of those Star Wars movies based on any ion engine that we understand. But maybe it's because there's two. Hmm, maybe something about two of them that we haven't even figured out yet. But who knows? Anyway, I just think that's funny that there really is an ion engine. And maybe someday we'll have twin ion engines. And hopefully they don't get into fights. So that brings us to angular momentum. L equals I omega. That's a lowercase omega. Looks a little bit like a W. L stands for angular momentum. I is the moment of inertia, which is kind of like a stand-in for the mass of the object. And omega is the angular velocity of the object. But we have stand-ins for these. We have another way to calculate angular momentum. And that is to use the radius of the circle, r, and the momentum, the regular momentum. So L equals rp is another variation on the definition of angular momentum. And that should make a little more, that should be a little easier for you to calculate because you've seen those things before. And remember that momentum can be split up into the mass of the object and the velocity. So if we do that, we wind up with this one, the angular momentum L equals RMV, okay? The radius of the circle times the mass of the object and the linear velocity, the velocity it has at any moment going around that circle. This is a little bit easier to calculate um, under most circumstances. And just like linear momentum, angular momentum has a conservation law. And I think you may have noticed that when I was going through the list of conservation laws. Well, here is the very classic example, one of the most classic examples of the conservation of angular momentum. We like to use people on ice, okay? Ice skaters, why? Because there's low friction, okay? So in the figure below shows an ice skater spinning with her arms extended. When she pulls her arms in, she begins to spin faster. Okay, without any external force, her angular momentum will not change. If she is a closed system, if there is no force coming in or out, let's assume that her weight is balanced by the normal force through the skate on the ice, then the angular momentum has to be conserved. But the only problem is angular momentum depends on radius. So when she brings in her extremities, like her arms, closer to the center, well, then the R decreases rapidly. So to make up for that, you get a much, much faster velocity, okay? Or you could say omega, which is angular velocity, okay? So this is just the most classic example. And again, one of the reasons is, even though this occurs all over the place, physicists like to use situations where the friction is low or negligible. On ice, that is almost true. It's never true, but it's almost true, okay? So just by pulling your arms in, and you could do this yourself as long as you're careful, even if you're spinning slowly with your arms extended, turning slowly, pull your arms in, and you will rotate faster. You could do this on a spinning chair. There's lots of situations where this can occur. This is also the principle involved in a gyroscope, okay? Because a gyroscope, such as the one shown here, is a wheel that spins rapidly, okay? Because it's spinning so fast, it has a lot of angular momentum. That makes it really, really hard for it to be turned in any direction. And they use gyroscopes to stabilize things, okay? Because of its very large angular momentum, you have to apply a lot of torque, which is sort of like a rotation on the body, in order to move it at all. Okay, so they use the angular momentum of a rapidly rotating 
disk to avoid rotation, basically. We can also observe this in our own solar system, because I don't know if you've ever noticed, but almost everything in our solar system goes around in the same direction. Okay, it goes around in what we call counterclockwise from the north. Okay, the sun rotates that way, the earth rotates that way, the earth orbits that way, the moon goes around that way, pretty much all the planets go around that way. Pretty much almost everything in our solar system goes around the same way. Now, why is that? It's because of the conservation of angular momentum. Imagine that our solar system once was a disk of matter, a huge disk of slowly rotating elements, okay, a cloud. Now, those elements had a certain angular velocity, right? But as they were drawn into the center by gravity, the angular momentum had to be preserved. So in order for that to be preserved, they had to move faster. So there was probably an initial drift to the cloud. It was sort of just going on average in some direction to begin with and very, very slowly, barely noticeable. As that material was brought in closer to the center, that was exacerbated. That motion was um, sort of magnified, amplified, until finally we wound up with these fastly moving, fastly rotating bodies that we have in our solar system now. Okay, so I'm modeling it here with a cloud that is shrinking and it's going faster and faster. Of course, it would be more gradual than this, but that leads us to all the objects going around the sun in the same direction and the sun itself rotating in that direction. Not to mention that the bodies are also rotating in that direction if you were to zoom in on them. So pretty much everything in our solar system goes around the same way counterclockwise when viewed from above the north pole of the earth or above the north solar pole okay what we call the north pole of the sun you might not realize that the sun has poles even though well the sun magnetically flips its poles every 11.2 years well let's not worry about that so that is the end of the notes on propulsion in space and the next one i'm going to do is a video with some examples some additional examples